Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Lima Online. Um, tonight we're gonna celebrate, I can say, the, the work and life of Nan Hoover. And I have two fabulous guests to do that with. And um, they are here already, uh, Quirin Raquet and Elena Muskens. Welcome and thank you so much for joining me on this ride. Well, thank you, Sonica. And we just want to say that today uh, would have been Nan's 90th birthday. Exactly. Yeah. That's um, why I mentioned the celebration. So, yeah, she would have turned 90 today. And it actually was a bit of a coincidence that we organized uh, this uh, night on this day, because I just emailed you with, do you want to organize a night around Nan Hoover? And you told me like, oh, it's her birthday. So... Yeah, what a lovely coincidence. Yeah, she would have loved that. <laughs> That's so nice. And yeah, um, for me, it was very obvious to ask you to, to do this night with me, but maybe you can tell a little bit uh, about like your relationship with Nan, when you met her and what she, and of course, like we're going to go through that the whole night, but just for everyone at home to, to be a bit on the same page, like... Um, what is, what is Nan to you? When do you meet her? Did you meet her? And um... Well, I remember the first meeting with Nan. Um, I studied, I did a, a, the Rietveld Academy uh, like ages ago. And after that, I did a master at, it was called Das Arts. It's called Das Theater at the moment. Uh, and it was, it, it was, uh, it was run by uh, Ritzart and Kaatse. And I remember when uh, I started at Das uh, Arts, Richard asked me, like, who are the people you would really love to meet when you are studying here the, the, the coming years? So Nan Hoover was absolutely one of them. I, would, I, I said, I would love to meet Marina Abramovic, Nan Hoover, Bill Fiona. I met them all. I didn't believe it at that time. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, never going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, uh, we made like an installation at Los Arts and uh, Nan came. Uh, to visit us. In those days, Dassart was at the Westergasfabriek terrain. The, so like the whole Westergasfabriek terrain was Dassart. And one of the buildings that was like the place I was doing, uh, or we were doing the uh, installation. And I remember, um, because I was looking for a person who would be Nan Hoover. So I was watching, uh, I was uh, watching, uh, watching like outside, was looking. And then I saw this person coming with like, in black, with a, with a huge, large coat, and she had a hat on with red lipstick. So she would we have been very happy with our styling, by the way. Red <laughs> lipstick, black, white, perfect. So that was like the first time I saw Nan Hoover live. And then she came and she watched the, the show. And then she said, shall we have dinner? Yeah, so we had dinner. And um, actually, we never stopped talking after that. And she said, I would love, uh, uh, it would be great if we could become friends. Well, I mean, that was like wonderful. So that was like when it started, I think it was 1997 when we met. And after that, we, like, we started having correspondence. Uh, we started writing and having video letters. And then also uh, Nan came to Dossard's to teach uh, and after that like we were friends and uh, we had like our monthly gatherings and we had like Nan called them our din dins that's like a dinner and then we would have a dinner in her studio we would have drinks and we would talk about life art and everything else and well it was always a great joy and a great pleasure fantastic yeah yeah, and we, we never stop talking about Nan as well, I think. Uh, we, are, we are also having this night as a sort of pre-event to next week, which is a festival that is entirely revolving around the body of work of Nan Hoover, where we invite artists to reinterpret her work. And along the way of organizing this, I also got to talk to this artist, and it's just... I don't know, like Nan just uh, makes for endless conversations about art and, and life. And I think that's also why I thought of you, like you are very close to her art, but also very close to her life. And um, I don't know when is gonna be a good moment because we have this fabulous work of yours uh, 
My Life as an Artist, Nan Hoover, in which you also portray her. And you see also how in her life, um, art and life are so much intertwined or like how art is her life. So um, yeah, I think that's, um, that's a bit also the, the angle of the night. And, and we're gonna also see some work by uh, Nan Hoover later on, but that you will probably also introduce to us. But um, yeah, this, this um, I call it a documentary, but it's um, the funny thing is with your work, it's also hard to pinpoint what it is. Like um, and we talked of this, we, we had a pre-talk for this event and I talked how, how your work like goes through all um, boundary, like discipline boundaries, like it's theater, but it's performative, it's documentary, it's video art. And um, that comes back in your work, but also in Nan's work. But so yeah, I call it a documentary for the time being, but can you tell a bit about like how this came about and um, um, about the process of making this with Nan as your subject? Yeah, the title of this, this work is uh, My Life as an Artist. And uh, we made it a couple of years ago in 2015. Um, and we filmed it all in Berlin uh, when, when Nan was living like there at the Gartenstadt uh, Berlin because she moved from Amsterdam in the uh, last three years of she moved from um, Amsterdam to Berlin and started a whole new career over there which was really fabulous yeah yeah and it's also like uh, my life as an artist is like um, part of, of, of like three short films so we made two other films one was called uh, my life as the show jumper and my life as a dancer and it's actually about three elderly, excuse me, Nan, ladies uh, looking back on their lives. And because we thought like these three ladies, they like were born in the 20s, 30s and really chose for a life of their own. And for, I mean, women in, in those times it was quite exceptional to have uh, the courage and the power to do so. And we were very amazed that like the, uh, uh, although they come from different like that's also maybe why it's like free screen because it's like a, a free channel uh, film in a way. Um, but it's re we found it really interesting that they had like all the same patterns in their lives. So there were like three different ladies, different geographical backgrounds, but still the pattern of being a woman and choosing your own path had like similar, similar patterns or something that really intrigued us. And then, of course, was like one of the ladies, like we thought, yeah, should definitely be uh, part of this uh, project. As we had so many talks with her about like life, uh, work, uh, choices in life, prioritizing, uh, being a woman, uh, being a woman, uh, uh, doing your own thing, um, what to do or not, or how to handle things. So Nan wasn't only like a friend, but also a master in a way for, for us as an example of how to lead a, a life um, uh, in freedom. And, and like we filmed, because I just said the films from 2015, we filmed it over years. So uh, Nan didn't see the end result. No, I remember when she uh, called us and she just heard she was terminally ill, she said, okay, Green, she was like, you know, she has this great voice. Green, are you sitting down? So she had really like a bad message. She wasn't going to live very long anymore. So she said, you have to hurry up with this movie. <laughs> and we had, we had to really come to Berlin to finish it. So that's what we did. And that was also the last time we saw Nan alive. I remember we were having coffee she said, don't you think it's so surreal? We're having coffee and I'm leaving. And, and well, so most of the material that we see, because it looks like we see her talk in one, or mostly in one setting. And that is shot when she was uh, already ill. So she knew already she was. Think, uh, yeah, like some of, it, some of it, like one third of it was shot when she was like the last time we saw her. And like two thirds is also shot in Berlin, but it was her studio, so it was still the same, um, yeah, yeah, setting. Yeah. But that was like before she knew she was ill. Yeah, but part of it is because it's it's such an extremely vivid portrait. You cannot imagine that at any point 
uh, when she's speaking, she knows she's she's going to die. So that's uh, but, but yeah, that's that's her strength. And is it what is it that like uh, she was like? Of course, you said like you had art, but do you do you see she was more a life guide or a guide into art, or or is that that's at all when you when you think of your relationship with her? No, I think it was both. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was both. Like the passions you have, you share, or the visions you have of like opinions, or even sometimes discussions or quarrels or whatever. I mean, everything was always um, uh, elevating. But I think Nan really lived her art. She was like really a true, true artist, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even her house yeah. was like wonderful. Like if you go to the bathroom of Nan Hoover, everything is black. Like the toilet is black, the washing machine is black, the bathtub is black, it was all black. So like she was really, really specific mm -hmm. on what she wanted and how she wanted to live. Yeah, her art also is very specific, but at first it never has this extravagance that like you that that you reveals when you talk of her. So that that there is like layered work in which you first and, and we also told you it's like are very much struck by the, the quite formal approach even and it's often what people say when they talk about her work it's about the passage of time the uh, uh, yeah how the body can become an abstract form how she plays with form how she plays with light and shadow uh, but I think there's something under the surface that is way more personal and performative than you would see at first yeah, I think so too. I think I totally agree. I mean, there's a very uh, sensitive layer also, like um, the whole perception of things, but also like the representation. I think Nan is like a front runner, uh, like maybe in the 70s, like uh, uh, it's, it wasn't more normal to really um, uh, analyze the work of Nan as like more as a formal work. But if you, if you would put it in the perspective of these times, it's more like she's like the one of the front runners of interdisciplinary art form, I think. I mean, it's a place where uh, performance, theater, uh, visual arts, uh, technology, everything is assembled in a way. And also like the representation of the body or being a, a woman or, you know, all these, the notions are really, I think, yeah, for me, she's really like a, a front runner. I mean, if you think about the representation of the body or of yourself, like in this selfie age, yeah? where you represent yourself all the time. I think she's really a front runner because she was like the, the first person actually working with, an, with a camera in a way that she was representing uh, on a conscious level, her body and her image and uh, huh? transforming it into an art piece. I mean, yeah. and and and. What also struck me is like how she, how intuitively she also works when it looks quite calculated. But when you hear her story also about falling in love with the camera, but also the coincidence of having this video camera in the first place, um, it, it at first it doesn't rhyme so much with how, with with the formal aspect of her work that like that she so intuitively like picked up a thing and and then. Uh, couldn't stop doing it. And I think that's also why often we see her as a video artist, because once you had this camera, that was for so many years that she never put it down. So when before she was all into painting and, 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 and she traveled the world to, to deepen her painting practice, once the, yeah. once the camera was there, there was nothing else. Like Nan always said, like, um, I'm not a video artist, I'm a visual artist. So that's, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's actually also how she introduces herself in, in, uh, in your film. And, uh, yeah. She also exactly. says, it, quite, it also struck me when I heard it quite explicitly, like almost a bit provocative because she knows that many people see her differently, that she was like, I'm going to present myself that yeah. way. Yeah, it's really like a visual artist. What also struck me, uh, that's also in the film that she's standing like, when she was very young, she always went to the sea and had, uh, uh, by herself. 
and that um, she thought that all her work is from that place in a way, because she was always looking at the water, at the movement of the water, at the light. So these things were really uh, there already at a very, very early age, like when she was four or five years old. Um, she was already an artist in a way. She was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe this is a nice moment to actually watch the film now that we have a bit like set the stage and um, yeah, maybe we're gonna just uh, play it and, and, and enjoy it collectively. So uh, yes. Great. My, my life as an artist, you're gonna watch it now, enjoy. My name is Nan Hoover. I am a visual artist, and this is my life. I had a very interesting childhood, very much alone. I was raised by my mother. I met my father only one time when I was five years old to make up for this loss. Uh, my mother gave me unconditional love. So I spent my early years alone with my grandparents. Because I was alone and because I didn't have the normal playing with other children and so forth, I, and because of not understanding why I wasn't in the normal framework of family, um, I developed uh, my own dreams. My mother sent me to boarding school at five years old. Uh, one day, the nun comes to me and says, uh, your father is coming. And I, the, it's like crystal. I can remember the moment your father is coming. I put on a little dress. He came. Uh, he drove me to the village. He bought me an ice cream cone. And on the way back, he taught me to whistle. Oh, this was wonderful. Um, and then he left, and I never saw him again. Of course, every time I whistle, he flashes for seconds, split seconds, in front of my eyes. And that's also, for me, very interesting, because the only time I think of him is if I... What was I saying? Uh, I never saw him again, but he left me with a whistle. Ah, here it is. This is uh, my grandfather, who I mentioned earlier, and who was uh, so important in my life because uh, he was my, you could say, my uh, sub father substitute. I spent um, much of my time with my grandparents. Uh, it was a, a very large house. What I loved most about this house was uh, walking around in the house and looking through old photographs um, that were left uh, under the piano uh, bench. And that made up uh, my days. Uh, as a little girl, I developed uh, an imagination I lived in my dream world.
at the end of where we lived in Blue Point, Long Island, uh, was the Long Island Sound. And uh, I was very, very small to walk that stretch alone. Um, I didn't have this normal parental supervision um, because I was with my grandparents and they did not dote on me. They both ha had their things to do and uh, uh, let me wander, so to speak. I remember I used to love walking to the sound and sitting on the little piece of sand and looking at the, uh, the Long Island Sound. On the way to this walk, there was a house. And in the yard, quite a large l yard on the corner, and I always saw children playing. These children were about my age and a little bit older. I always thought, I wonder what they're doing, you know, what it is it like to play with other children. So I decided at one moment to go over to them and say hello, um, give them my name and see what will happen. And uh, I don't remember exactly what we did, but what I do remember was I did not find it as interesting as what I normally do, which was walking down to the sea and sitting, thinking, and looking, and then walking back. I am a voyeur. I watch the world as it goes by me. If you're in it, you can't observe it. And when I was 11 years old, I was walking, because I, I still continue to walk. <laughs> I loved walking through woods, walking by myself. Uh, there was a small lake near our house. My mother had remarried, and there was a small lake, and I walked to the opposite end of it. The sun was just going down. And I said to myself, very clearly, I have to be an artist, because in this way, I can be myself. When you make such a decision in your life, it's a little bit like putting blinders on. You have the focus. Your whole life is then in focus. After graduating from, uh, from Gunston School, my stepfather said, as stepfathers are, uh, I think you should uh, go to secretarial school and learn something practical. And I looked at my mother, dumbfounded. Huh? huh? And my mother, being my mother, no. She's going to art school. And of course, it was my grandfather who put me through art school. During this time uh, in Washington, I met my husband, the father of my children. Uh, he studied painting at the same art school. When uh, the children were born, for me, there was never a question, would I continue or not? Of course I would continue. I had already decided. I had the blinders on. This is something that the men in my life have had great difficulties understanding about me. That I have a number one, and that is my creativity. I also have three wonderful children. But there is a number one.
New York has very poignant memories for me. Uh, my grandfather had an apartment in Tudor City, which is next door, <laughs> directly next to the UN, facing the East River. When I was in New York with my grandparents, I would spend a lot of time. It seemed to me all the time, but of course it wasn't. But much time looking out the window, watching the boats go by. His apartment was quite high. And for me, that movement of the water, the boats coming and going, is the root of much of my work, coming and going. Going where? Coming from where? And uh, then I returned to New York. I uh, spoke to my husband and uh, I asked him if it would be possible if he could uh, take the children and I wanted to go further with uh, developing my painting. And this was very agreeable to him. He was a wonderful father. I mean, he was very devoted to the children. And uh, so it wasn't as if I just picked up and flew up. It was just by chance that I came to Holland uh, in 69. I uh, had the possibility to take a flight uh, in a private plane of a um, very wealthy man uh, from Chicago who had bought one of my paintings. His private plane was going to London. When I was in London, I decided, just very spontaneously, to go to Amsterdam. And so I arrived in Central Station, and uh, then um, walked to the hotel, and in that time, decided to live in Amsterdam. It was just like falling in love. I met um, Richard in 1973. I uh, was working in the Pell's Cafe, cooking, uh, and uh, on the way home, I stopped to uh, have a glass of wine. By chance, saw another friend. He introduced me to Richard Hefty. And uh, we became very close friends, and then lovers, of course. And then finally, we were married. And it was via Richard's first wife, uh, Stephanie, who called us one day in 1973 and said, uh, we have a video camera here. Um, I think you should buy it, Richard. And when he got off the phone, he said to me, Stephanie has a video camera and thinks we should buy it. And I said, if Stephanie thinks we should buy a video camera, I think we should do it because she has a way of seeing things that we other mortals cannot see. One day I was uh, in Richard's studio. We were... Uh, experimenting with uh, the video uh, camera, and he said to and me... And I like this story very much, because he said to me, pick up the camera, Nan. And so I picked it up, without even thinking, and looked in the lens. This was the first time. And I was absolutely enthralled. I thought this, oh, what is this? This is fantastic. For 20-odd years, it was painting until I picked up my first video camera. And then I had an explosion of ideas 
because for the first time, I could move in front of the camera. I could work with time. I could work with light. And that was the beginning. So my whole world changed. Uh, I had an extremely busy uh, period of doing, uh, showing the work, uh, doing lectures, uh, doing performances, which began to come into my life. I was very pleased to be invited uh, to uh, show my work in Documenta, and I made a three-channel installation uh, for MoMA in 1979. Then I had it uh, in my mind to make a desert. Not to do the real thing, I wanted to do what we think of it. it. Even if we have never been there, how we imagine it to be. I struggled to find the desert for almost two years. I could not find that image to, that satisfied me to give me the feeling of shifting sand. One day, just like that, tuck, I had it. Uh, I did not put sound on the tape because I imagined that in the desert there's no sound and was later told by somebody who had been to the desert, uh, there is sound constantly. Success is like uh, the cream on the cake. Now, if you have a delicious sake tort, you don't need all the extra uh, cream on top because the sake tort is great as it is. So the cream on the top is only, that's success. So it's only a kind of extra. It's an addition, but it's not really necessary to enjoy the sake tort. Success is really tough on uh, partners. My first husband also was jealous of my work. My second husband was also jealous of my work. With the second one, Richard Hefty, I tried really everything, all kinds of techniques of protecting him from too much information about what I'm doing. Richard uh, and I were married for five years. It was extremely difficult, and his problem was that because of my success and the um, feedback I was getting, he became very jealous. You know, more jealous than if I had had an affair. Who has time for an affair when you have so much work to do? <laughs> you know, But it became obsessive. It was too much for me. I, uh, once it began to... Uh, touch my creative spirit and my balance and my being able to um, live. I said to him, it's not that I don't love you, it's that I can't live with you. By 1986, I counted 12 performances, three solo shows and maybe four big major for me uh, group exhibitions. I was exhausted. I mean, I really became exhausted from all the traveling. I was constantly going out, coming back, not packing, unpacking a suitcase, repacking a suitcase. For me, I have to have this balance. Um, I need the studio work. I need my silence. Again, I'm not a very social person. I never have, even as a child, as I mentioned. I spent a lot of time alone. I enjoy my own company. So I made a very conscious decision to, uh, to start drawing, and that's what I did. I did less performance work, uh, fewer video, and more drawings. Uh, 
uh, older people become almost invisible. Uh, it was rather a jolt mm, mm, to suddenly mm, realize that now I'm in this area where you become almost invisible. So how do you make yourself visible again? I uh, came upon the idea coming out of the shower, reaching for the towel to dry myself, and said, you have to move. I went in, poured myself a cognac, and I said, where? Berlin. You can smell the energy. There's an energy about Berlin that is similar to the energy I felt in New York in the 60s. You felt it in your pores. In life, we go towards a decision. It's like going towards a door. And we have our hand out. And we have our hand almost to the handle. And at that moment, we have to make a decision. Do we go a little further and do we open the door? And then do we walk through? It's a decision of life. Uh, welcome back, everyone. And um, yeah, Karina and Elena, thank you so much for making this work. I'm, oh, I, I watch it with so much pleasure because Nan is so vivid and, and, and so inspiring. And um, yeah, I think we all secretly want to be Nan when we, when we see this, despite the, uh, the toughness of her life, like in the decisions she makes, but she, she, she speaks of it with so much ease and, and humor. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's very impressive. And um, yeah, we were, we were talking about this humorous side of her and, and you can see it so much when we watch this um, uh, film, but we don't really see it, maybe not at all in her work. Do we, what, what do you think? She was quite a humorous person. She was really always very um, uplifting and uh, tongue in cheek in a way also. Yeah, yeah, but she was also really sharp, sharp and strict yeah. and concentrated yeah. and very aware. Yeah. And I think you can see that in her work. It's all about awareness and Oh, and yeah. it's about vision and awareness and it's it's quite meticulous in a way yeah and yeah. timing she always talked about the timing the sound the movement the colors the, 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 the how long it take was the decisions like 
how you should be aware of your decisions or not and what was better so this yeah yeah for me there's this wonderful moment in the in the film that she talks about the boats passing by and that she says like coming from where going to where and I think that is very like particular for her for work and it also made me understood um, made me understand better like her work that it is there's the, 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 the poetry of the movement, but there's also uh, the not knowing what was before and what is after. So this reaching into the unknown, leaving behind things. And I also think she's, she, she never really looked back. So a movement is also always a movement towards uh, the unknown. And this mystery about movement became more clear to me when I, when I saw this film, that it is really part like, of a way of looking uh, at the world. Yes, and she also also had the courage uh, to step into the unknown. And like when she uh, first came to Amsterdam, like when she really fell in love with Amsterdam and decided immediately to decide, well, I'm going to stay here. And then when she was in her 70s, she decided to move to Berlin and she just did it. I mean. Yeah, that's why I said we all want to be Nan a little bit. I mean, I, I find that so admirable that you just indeed like enter a city and say, and that was the moment I made the decision, I'm going to live here. And she did it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's so really beautiful how you describe the work. Like it's like an ongoing thing. So that yeah. it's, it's, it's never about doubts or it's like it's a movement going on and into the unknown. I think uh, you really uh, described it very beautifully. So maybe this is a good moment to have a look at her work. What do you think, Sonica? Or, I yeah. was thinking of it, yeah, because, um, yeah, now that we see the woman, we want to see the work. So, yeah, I, I would say let's directly go to a, to a work of hers that we are, again, all on the same page. And, um, yeah, we're going to watch a movement from either direction. Do you want to give it a, a little bit of introduction or do we just, like... Go for it. What do you think? I think we go for it. We can talk about it afterwards. Maybe. Okay. Okay. It's yeah. going to be six minutes of movement by Great. Nan. So enjoy. <laughs> we'll be back after.
And welcome back again. And finally, after being almost an hour into this event, we saw something by the master herself. And um, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we didn't see it um, because we we're in the Zoom, but we, uh, we discussed it while you were watching it. And um, yeah, I, I, I really very much like what you said, Karine, about like um, that, that, that she knows where she's going. And we discussed that if you, if you know where you're going, the movement doesn't have to be fast. And that's actually because often her work is read as contemplative or like slowness or for the sake of slowness. But I think there was is something about her work that she just knows so well where she's going. And there's a sort of sec being secure in it that it can be slow. She doesn't have to run because he's, she's in control. Yeah. It's, it's very much about like control. Yeah, it's true what you said, but it's also like she told us like, um, uh, because when she makes the work, she's actually watching herself. So it, she's actually uh, discovering and contemplating and reflecting on it in the same time. And that's something you can really feel in the work, that it's not just only doing something. There's also a whole uh, state of mind which is uh, involved while doing it. And she often told us that she actually uh, discovered something while doing it and then started getting curious again in continuing. And then while continuing dis discovering and then reflecting on it and then like making these choices all the time. And there was the whole time, all the time, it was like contemplating between like a kind of intuition and a kind of um, like um, uh, more like a rational uh, reflection uh, on it. So it was like a dialogue. And that's something you can really feel, I think, sense in her work. Absolutely. And uh, what I previously also said to you, what I feel with the work of Nan is that you can look through her eyes for the time of the work. And actually, what you say now is very much related to that because she is also seeing the work through her own eyes, like being like being made while it's being made but you feel that as as um, as a viewer that you like um, you get to see the world her body and and everything through different eyes for, for yeah. a moment yeah. yeah and it's like it's like a before because the, uh, if it's live it's also like about awareness but like when you're in a live performance you never actually see what you're doing Exactly. Uh, because therefore you need a director, but now you're your own director doing your performance, but also being like the spectator and the audience in one. So, yeah, and that's really, I think, something a notion she really found interesting to play with. Like, and also she's always told us it's also about decisions. Like she decides mm -hmm. to do something, then she follows it. She sees what happens and then evolves. And that's also like one why we uh, chose like the work you just saw is because I remember uh, at one time she told us like um, life is it's like doors. So like some doors open, some doors close, but it's actually just like redirecting your gaze. And that was like, I think that's also something that you can feel in her work that she's actually directing but also redirecting our gaze and yeah. that you start to reflect on certain notions and even like a phil philosophical themes uh, or um, yeah uh, while watching the work absolutely yeah it's it's directing and redirecting the gaze is very interesting and um, we now saw work that involves her body and I think the gaze in relate in regard to the body is very important but she also always tends to uh, a more abstract um, side or like how do you how do you see this 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 role of the body because she's in a way she's a, she's a feminist in, in a way she dealt with her art and her life but in a way that she deals with the female body that's completely different because it's not the female body it's just a body it's just body parts or the body as a messenger or like an image maker like how do you see that that like which role does the body play yeah, I think I think like the awareness about the body and like like what I said like being 
being being the body and feeling the body and then seeing what the body can do um, so like directing and perceiving and moving and creating and it all coincides so like i think uh, she sees it as a as a, I, I think as a vessel uh, and um, uh, it's nearly like a, a game uh, or a game. It's, it's a reflection in, in, in multiple la layers of perception and how to enhance that notion. And what does it touch upon in life or in uh, nature or what is the body? And like, um, it also has a, a, a lot to do about life and death in ways like what is existence? What is being there? What is movement? What is the body? I mean, it's such a strange being in a way, mm. huh? but it's a beautiful form. Yeah. And that, yeah, I think, uh, and then really like to uh, create things, uh, combining the body and the light and the movement. Um, so like these elements were, very, I think, really important. And because it's so so simple, it's also so strong. Yeah, I, I was thinking like often artists say that they travel with the mind, but she travels with the body because the body is, a, and of course she often relates to landscapes. And, and But also she could make everything with her body the way she imagined it or so. And that like, I find it an interesting inversion that this, this body becomes the tool for creating a landscape. And that is not a mental landscape, but it's really a bodily uh, landscape that's a very interesting yeah. notion yeah but it's like desert eh? because she told us she okay. made desert with like these rolls of paper actually and then moving the lights yeah. so it always had to do with like the movement of the body but like it was always like a, a dialogue with different elements creating an imaginary uh, uh, yeah. state in a way yeah yeah, it's so, oh, it's so, so interesting. And um, you also picked another work that um, relates to these things, but also, yeah, has another beautiful personal story um, that is encapsulated in it. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and then always, uh, because she, she, she loved light, like the reflection of light, and she also liked being quiet. So uh, a lot of the time she like divided her time in um, being outside with the world, as she told us, but also she needed her quiet time. And quiet timing meant no email, no telephone, no people. That was her time. So that was like the time that she was like um, watching, concentrating and like getting to the essence of what, what she was interested in. And um, uh, she always told us, like, uh, you could also see that, like, in uh, my life as an uh, artist, that she was talking about, like, observing the sea, the light, the movement, the flickering. And then she told us that, like, I think when she had her studio, that she was, like, really intrigued by, like, this empty space and, like, the reflection of light on the wall and the movement and the, what it reflected, and that it sometimes was more like the city, sometimes more like something like uh, the light. And um, that's why we would like to show uh, this work um, because many times when we are somewhere or we're talking or blah, 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 uh, like a light reflection uh, appears in the house or somewhere in the space. And then we always have the feeling um, it's Nan. She's creating a work for us. So it's really like a mode just to watch to be quiet and to see what happens. So that's why we would like to, well, also include this uh, work because I think uh, uh, this is like a sign that she's here. Fantastic. I think with no further ado, we're gonna watch projections. <laughs> Enjoy.
And here we are again. Um, thanks for picking this work. It's, it's real nice. And I think many of us, or at least I, if I cannot look at light reflections for a little while like without like thinking of this. And I think that's uh, also the, the beauty of the word of Nan that we described that she really like gives you different eyes to look at the world. And now like an everyday phenomenon becomes uh, a bit more loaded or a bit more different. So she can really shine different lights on, on, on the everyday. And um, in, the, in the background, when you were at home watching this, we also kept on reflecting on the work, reflecting on the reflections. And um, yeah, we came to talk about like, um, our work is, 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 is not always so accessible uh, and how it is, um, and Queen you said also, because it's, it's non-narrative based, there's, there's no narrative. Um, and that's also why it's often said as formal, but you can also reverse that and say that it, that it entails endless narratives, but that, is, um, that, it's, that makes it difficult because we were talking like that you can come back to the work and every time it can mean something else, um, which means that it's, it's very much about Nan, but actually it also starts to become about you as a viewer. So she makes you really, um, she takes you seriously, but also makes you a bit responsibility in creating a narrative. Yeah, yeah, well said. Thanks. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's really nice because it's really, um, work that uh, that needs a bit for this kind of dialoguing back and forth to really like pinpoint what it is about and uh, uh, it's so funny because it's a lot of talking about such silent um, silent work so, yeah um, but I think we can go a little bit towards um, your practice also which is um, completely different it's it's not it's not at all silent and it's often uh, uh, quite clearly telling a story but there's there's often a bit of nan in there so um how is it that you that you bring nan into into your work and um... uh I, maybe it was i think it's also like our our the work we made before this is what was very silent and i think very uh uh related to nan we made like really slow films without any talking mm -hmm with morphing we did a lot with morphing uh, moving between uh, the human and the uh, and animals and like really slow changes um, mm -hmm. and then I think after our theater work uh, we started working with the uh, text I think uh, it's theater did it <laughs> that's why we started doing text blame and, it on uh, the theater probably, yeah. Yeah. yeah so we had another perspective and we started working with like uh, more documentary elements, but we, our, our way of working is always very uh, in a hybrid way. So we work with sometimes with real people and then we let them reenact or, huh? Uh, and all our work is uh, like the themes we, uh, we, we were working with is always about identity and community. So like we made a film, The Tower, about like an aristocratic hippie uh, family in a tower. Then we made like a film about like, um, uh, the Disney identity, like what kind of identity do we have if we're not in um, communities anymore uh, or not really into religion anymore, like people start to, to create their own identity by mirroring themselves to Disney. Or we made a film about the fans of Kate Bush, it's like about mirroring identity towards like celebrity cultists. And then we made a film like about um, I Love Venice is like about the Disneyfication of a city. So like how you lose your identity, which is related to a city. Um, and we made like a film about people living in the twenties in these times, but then like uh, mirroring themselves uh, through uh, the 1920s of the last century. So it's all about identity and community. And uh, like in the work we're working on now, is a lot, has a lot to do with um, the hybridization of identity, like the blurring boundaries of identity, like what is gender, uh, what is nationality, um, what is age, what is time. So now we're really interested in the blurring boundaries of identity. So like, I think our work is moves through disciplines, but always um, has the theme of identity and community. 
Yeah, it, it, this mirroring aspect is really interesting how you say it. And 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 did you ever put the mirror back at yourself? <laughs> yeah, <Is> there... <laughs> I, I think I think we're in all all the films are about us. Like yeah. we're working on a feature film at the moment, and it's also like a, a hybrid film. It's based on two real stories, but then it's less fictionalized. And so there are like two actors, but all the other people are non-actors and there are also cameos of famous people. So we really like to work with like these different uh, forms of reality and identity. And this also has to do a lot with um, um, uh, what happens when you leave your country and you come into another country and um, do you ever regain an identity when you leave? So like, what does it need to be unrooted? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, which is which sorry, relates it, very yeah. much to the life of 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 Nan. And yeah. but it's it's so interesting because she never. Uh, it could have been super political work, like if, since it's about the body and and the way she 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 was as a as a female artist uh, in a system that was like quite male dominated, even more of course in her early times. And but but she always escaped this explicit uh, political statement in her in her work. Although she was a very uh, very political, hardcore. Hard, she was really like a hardcore Democrat. She was really like um, um, Trump. Yeah. She would have died <laughs> if, if she knew that Trump. Was she was there. like a hardcore Obama fan. So yeah, yeah. Mm. But it's true, right? That it, that is never like. Oh, can you read that in a work if you know her very well, or you would say that she kept that completely? No, no, uh, no, no, not at all. No, no. 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 Yeah. But to, to say something back, like about the feature film we're working on, that we just discovered that the, the film is about our lives. And that was something we didn't know when we started the project. So it's funny how you end up recreating your own stories. Oh, that's so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And w when is it, do you already know when it's going to be approximately finished? Well, fingers crossed, we have to film next year. Okay. But it's quite a long process, and it's uh, it's our debut in the feature film. So we wrote the script, and uh, now we're in the last stage of the financing. So we hope next year. Oh yeah, because I heard it implied also quite some traveling, which is um, yeah, it's not, it's not possible during Corona times. Yeah, we're uh, filming in uh, LA and in uh, Morocco, hopefully, and uh, in the. Uh, to uh, centers of the movie business, so. LA, so you'll go a bit also back to, uh, to Nan. Yeah, America. Yeah, she told us they will love us in LA. And <laughs> uh, Nan was like a real New York. She was a real New York, yeah. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. I know, I oh, know. Yeah. She was like in love with that city, yeah. <laughs> but love the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but only in yeah. her mind. Yeah, because she said, I made the desert, she made that work, uh, and she never went to the desert. So she never went to the desert in her life, but she made the work desert. She, made, she imagined, she imagined it. it. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's what indeed she talks of in the film. In the, and also that like, she thought of it for so long and then she got it, and I, I, yeah. Did you did you see that? That was she? Uh, yeah, she. I, I think she worked non-stop like I think she was always reflecting on her work but did she also had this sort of eureka moments that she was like now I have to I have to make something or how, how did it go like uh, yeah that's like what we said it's like her quiet time yeah that was the creation time yeah, yeah that was so like, it didn't happen in a sort of no, no. I think she was always working like in anyway her... watching mm -hmm. yeah thinking but I think it really, she really made, made things like in her quiet time, uh, yeah, in her, in the studio. She that is, that. this watching is, is so, is so key. And, uh, and you, you really see that she is someone who could watch and that like watching is really something you can be trained at. And like many, many artists oh, over the history of video and film uh, art have like, try to make us watch and sometimes with very long shots but you see when someone has made it who really knows how to watch and then you 
get to be in her in her feet and eyes for for moments. That's really yeah. 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 And also about seeing, yeah? watching, seeing, looking. Yeah. Yeah, which brings us a bit to uh, to the last part, and that's uh, not being seen. Uh, yeah. she, she refers to it that after a certain age, like people start to disappear. Uh, yeah, it was during one of our dinners when we were there, and she said, Corinne, you know, after a certain age, people don't notice you anymore. You start to become invisible. So what she was really talking about, like, how, what, what is it that you, that people don't see you after a certain age? So um, um, we were uh, thinking of uh, uh, doing a new work and we were going to work with Nicole Beutler and we were uh, discussing the themes. And then we said, well, um, uh, we would like to do uh, something. Uh, I think we, uh, sorry. Nicole said she would like to do something with elderly lion dance. And then we said, okay, let's do a flash mob. And then I said, oh, it's great because this work is actually a little bit for Nan because this is a way to make elderly people visible in the public uh, sphere. So that's why we thought we would conclude with this uh, short dance film um, as a way to, to say um, hello to Nan because she's visible again in a way right, in this evening. And also because she loves dancing. I mean, that was like one of her greatest passions. So uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit for you, Nan. It's nice. With this work, we really made this night into a bit of an homage. And now uh, we give, we, you give back to Nan after all that she has done for you. Um, that's so wonderful. I think we, we're gonna like screen it as a sort of bonus. So this is for us the moment to say goodbye to you at home. And for me, the moment to give a big thank you to you, Quirina and Helena. It was a real pleasure to engage in conversation with you and um, to, learn, to learn by speaking. That's a bit what we did, what I did tonight. <laughs> so thanks for that. And thank you, Nan, for making that happen. And, uh, thank, you, Monica. thank you for inviting us and it's great that we're doing this on Nan's birthday. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and she said to me that she didn't plan to die. She should have be, be 92. She should have been here. She that's should have she, been here with us. Yeah. Definitely. But she, she's, she's here a bit now and I'm, and I'm happy for that. And I also want to look a little bit into the future and that's to next week. Uh, next week, May 19th, we have the uh, unfold Nan Hoover Festival um, with um, reinterpretations of the work of Nan by Vera Sofia Mota, Davor San Vincenti, Sandra Sterle, and Judith de Jode, and a whole program by uh, the Dog Time Rietveld students in collaboration with Willem van Wilde and Francine van der Put. So we're going to talk, read, listen, watch. Uh, every medium I think is going to be explored and uh, that actually fits so well this pioneer interdisciplinary artist as Nan Hoover so I think she's going to be celebrated again next week um, but for now thank you so much and enjoy Diamond Dancers by Virin Raquet and Elena Moskowitz thank you so much mm -hmm.
Step to the side. 